amidst the backdrop of a decade that saw assassinations, domestic unrest, profound societal change, and a war that nightly filled the nation's living rooms with images of young American bodies broken in far-flung corner of Southeast Asia, accompanied by a narrative that a victory could be seen through the ghastly metric of the increasing body count of fallen enemies. Paul Simon wrote a song that captured the yearning spirit of this age that has only become more prescient in the decades that have since followed. In the sound of silence, Simon and Garfunkel sing of a world where the mighty words of the prophets are little more than graffiti on subway walls and tenement halls, where the people bow to the neon god they have made, and everywhere there is a silence growing like a cancer. What is it to be a prophet in this modern age? Is it to simply be a truth-teller in an era bombarded with falsehoods and fabrication? Is it to be a voice, no matter how small and lonely, that rages against the impending near certainty of our own annihilation? Do our prophets simply write songs that voices never share? Is anybody even listening anymore? If we look to the dictionary for guidance, we can see several definitions of prophet, ranging from a person who speaks for God or a deity, or by divine inspiration, or a person who predicts what is to come, to a spokesperson of some doctrine, cause, or movement. So, we have everything from an individual who is the divinely inspired mouthpiece of God to someone who is a cheerleader for a cause. And that's quite a range. In the Bible, the earliest usage of the term prophet can be found in the 20th chapter of Genesis, where God speaks to King Abelmelech in a dream telling him that he had better keep his hands off of Sarah, Abraham's wife, because Abraham was a prophet. Later in the book of Deuteronomy, we read of God speaking to Moses, telling him that he will raise up from them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet. Who shall speak to them everything I command? Anyone who does not speak in my name, I myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, or who presumes to speak in my name a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die. No pressure. Prophets abound throughout the 66 books of the Protestant Bible, but what they all have in common is that they are decrying injustice and reminding their audience of the times they have gone astray. In modern times, the prophets of old can be seen as forever punching up towards the systems, institutions, and policies that contribute to the suffering of the poor and the marginalized. In speaking truth to power, they never blame the victim for their situation. Contrast this with the chorus of contemporary voices who supposedly speak for God, yet fill the airwaves with a narrative that is altogether different. From the profoundly troubled King David writing his psalms in the lap of luxury, to Ezekiel, Ezekiel bearing the scorn of Israel for his role as God's watchman over their increasingly errant ways, we see people who are much more than advocates for a call celeb. But despite the veracity of their proclamations, they are often disregarded and cast aside by people who are hearing without listening. In the book of Isaiah, we read of, it, of Isaiah's lament. For they are rebellious people, faithless children, children who will not hear the instructions of the Lord, who say to the seers, do not see, and to the prophets, do not prophesy to us what is right, speak to us smooth things. Prophecy illusions, leave the way, turn aside from the path, let us hear no more about the Holy One of Israel. Suffice it to say, little has changed since the times of the ancient prophets of the Old Testament. The bones of countless truth-tellers litter history and all point to the fact that we don't like it when our falsehoods and misdeeds are laid bare. So where are we, as you use, in this discussion of truth-telling and the praxis of prophecy. The Unitarian Universalist Association came into being in 1961 after decades of courtship between these two traditions. 
tracing its roots through a liberal Protestant tradition and a theology that, for one, argued for universal salvation, and for the other, a reduction of complexity in the traditional tripartite division of God, the UUA was born into a decade that would see both incredible change as well as profound struggle. Hello darkness, my old friend. Against this backdrop of violence and change, from the first moments of its existence, the UUA has advocated for international peace and disarmament. At the first General Assembly of the nascent UUA in 1961, a general resolution was passed advocating for a total global disarmament of nuclear weapons and for the United States to lead the charge in negotiations for an end to further testing and development of these weapons. In the 57 years of its existence, the UUA has voiced its concerns about nuclear weapons including ICBMs and knapsack nukes, the weaponization of space, incendiary devices like napalm, specific weapons including landmines and munitions using depleted uranium, and to, end the, and to an end of the suicidal international arms race no fewer than 30 times. In 57 years, the UUA has gone on record 30 separate times to advocate for peace. And here we are in 2018 with our sabers rattling and pointing towards a new perceived threat in North Korea and the world edging ever closer to the modern eschatological promise of mutually assured destruction. Hear my words that I might teach you. Take my arms that I might reach you. 2010 saw the passing of a particularly beautiful statement of conscience at the annual General Assembly, one that makes me believe that an organization has the potential to be prophetic. In this document, the UUA stated the following, Our faith calls us to create peace, yet we confess that we have not done all we could to prevent the spread of armed conflict throughout the world. At times, we have lacked the courage to speak and act against violence and injustice. At times, we have lacked the creativity to speak and act in constructive ways. At times, we have condemned the violence of others, without acknowledging our own complicity in violence. We affirm a responsibility to speak truth to power, especially when unjust power is exercised by our own nation. Too often we have allowed our disagreements to distract us from all that we can do together. This statement of conscience challenges individual Unitarian Universalists, as well as our congregations and association, to engage with more depth persistence, and creativity in the complex task of creating peace. The statement goes on to articulate a historical perspective citing the creation of the Massachusetts Peace Society by Noah Worcester and William Ellery Channing, both prominent early 19th century Unitarians, and notes how this group was the first of its kind to unite factions repudiating all violence as well as those who supported defensive wars. The acknowledgement that complex problems can only be addressed by incorporating a wide spectrum of views is an ideal that modern UUs can certainly take heart in. From a theological perspective, this document expands on how the seven principles inform a position advocating peace and notes how we need to move away from a hard position of moral dualism. We need to see how neither nations nor people exist solely in the category of good or evil and how this ambiguity can lead us to a place where we can both cultivate the goodness in ourselves as well as others. Thus, the call to create peace in our world, our society, our congregations, our relationships, and within ourselves becomes an ever-ongoing project where we can truly side with love. In Restless Dreams I Walked Alone the work of the modern prophet is no less important, relevant, or timely than that of those of whom we read of in the Old Testament. But we need more from our modern prophets than to be a mere truth-teller, because anyone can look out into the world and readily see that things ain't right. What I feel modern prophets need is a realignment with the divine. In the Epistle of James we read, What good is it, my brothers and sisters? If you say you have faith, 
but do not have works, can faith save you? Faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. But what we have today is a curious inversion of this structure. We have works with no faith. The Pew Research Center, in its decades-long survey of the religious life of America, notes that across all age groups from the silent generation of the late 1920s to today's millennials, Christianity is in decline while nuns are steadily rising. This is a fascinating development. Mind you, the Pew Research Center has both atheist and agnostic among the several possible answers on their survey, but it is the group, nothing in particular, that is leading the charge for what is growing within our nation. People don't want to be labeled as either atheist or agnostic, but they cannot be party to a tradition that have so often failed to live up to its ideals. So, they are nothing in particular. Perhaps people have become tired of institutional religion as espoused by those who are on television either as humiliated frauds embroiled in yet another scandal, or who flash toothy grins and promise salvation in exchange for donations. They rightly see the falsity of these prophets. Perhaps in our relatively young tradition, people see our works, but they don't see spirit. They see that in our headlong pursuit of plurality, we, have missed, we may have missed a vital step that could make us more than mere cheerleaders who have said on 30 separate occasions that war and nuclear weapons have no place in our world. If we are to draw back from the edge of tautological insignificance, we need to invite spirit back into our works. If we are to be more than a Sunday morning social justice and coffee hour social club, we need to have the courage to dive into our plurality and weave together a new paradigm of spirit-infused prophetic witness. We need to boldly proclaim that through our free and responsible search for truth and meaning, we have discovered that which unites is far stronger than anything that tries to divide. If we desire to have a position of authenticity and significance when we boldly say that we side with love, it needs to come from a place of deep conviction and not pithy slogan. Simply put, other groups do social justice much better than we could ever hope to. But what they miss is what we so often deny in ourselves. Faith. Indeed, the words of the modern prophet may be hidden away on subway walls and whispered in the sound of silence. But let us find our voices lifted from a thousand different traditions and sing into that silence that we have seen the future. A future where the silence is not pierced by the cacophony of conflict, the cry of the wounded, the moan of the marginalized, but rather with the joy, love, and laughter that we people of faith know to be the true destiny of this rocky little blue jewel suspended in the heavens. Let this be what takes over for the silence. Let this be our prophetic witness. Thank you. And so it is.